It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to the VolQuest podcast right here at VolQuest.com, the Smoky Mountain Organics VolQuest podcast. East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store focusing on natural products and organic remedies to a variety of ailments. Three locations right here in East Tennessee, including one in Knoxville. It's at 801 8 Kingston Pike across the street from the Trader Joe's. And of course, you can always shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. No better time than right now to subscribe to the VolQuest YouTube channel, the start of fall camp. There's been plenty of media availabilities. We've heard from Josh Heupel twice already, heard from countless players, video highlights, podcasts, and more. So if you're not subscribed to VolQuest on YouTube right now, go ahead and uh, do yourself a favor and subscribe and follow us there on YouTube. Brent Hubs, Austin Price, Rob Lewis, along for the ride here today. I'm Eric Kane. And Guys, it's the start of fall camp. Brent Hubs, I think it's I think it's a safe assumption to say that this team looks different than it did a year ago. Simply put, they're farther along. They've got a little bit more depth. They know the system. It's a little bit different mindset for the team 365 days, you know, now compared to last year. Yeah, with the exception of uh, I, I guess Rodney Garner uh, teaching some young guys what, what life in the SEC under him is about. Hey, they got baptized uh, on Monday, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, you, you knew that they would. That's 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 the right way it rolls. I mean, there, there's such a – it's so different when guys know how to practice and guys know um, – coaches know what to expect from guys. And, and I think that's what you have – from a mentality standpoint, and, and then Rob, it's one day. Monday was one day. They're going out this morning. Um, some of you will be listening. To this second day will be in the books. But as we we do this, they, they're not yet going out on Tuesday morning. So it's just one day. But physically, they do look different for, from what we saw a year ago, and even what we saw in spring practice. Rob. Yeah, I mean, I just and again, let's all let's keep on hammering at home. One day, we're not you know making any dr- drastic proclamations, but. I, I don't think it's hyperbola or, you know, going too far out of the limb. They just, they look faster. They look more athletic. They look like, it looks like there's like ease. I mean, just to the naked eye, just more quickness. especially more quality the, bodies. Especially at the skill positions. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, I, I don't know if any of those freshman receivers are going to do anything this year, but Squirrel White is, it can fly. He's one of the quickest guys we've seen over there. Nimrod has, has great straight line speed. The tra- all the tr- the transfers and the defensive backfield, it's 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 made a difference in, in how they look. When, and like you said, they be more quality bodies. Yeah, um, uh, watching him run around in number ten just brought back memories of the Rev when uh, he runs that backside ju- uh, was it juice reverse or whatever it was. Georgia reverse or whatever on. whatever he ran like your life depended on it. Yeah. Come on, man! If you go if you go to drop the movie line, get the quote yeah, right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> I, it, it just the kid can run, man. I mean, like, I, how much impact is he going to have? I'm with Rob. I don't know, but I can. I, I think it's a fairly safe bet to say that he's going to be in on something at some point this year, just because. You can't teach that. You know, it's interesting, Austin, and, and we, we visited with some people um, over the course of the last week or so getting ready for the start of fall camp and, you know, just catching up with everybody as they come back off vacations and everything else. The one thing you hear about Squirrel White is tougher than his frame. Now, that doesn't mean that that he's going to be durable enough. We'll see. But 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 he's a guy who doesn't take a lot of big-time hits, but he plays tougher than maybe what you think his size would be. Because you look at him and go, oh, he's not big enough. But but everybody says he plays bigger than what he is. So we'll see what that looks like, right? That's right. I mean, again, you know, there are big guys that are soft. There are small guys that are tough. And, you know, if, if it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I get like you can only withstand so much at 165 pounds. But, you know, it, if you're tougher than, than most – then, you know, I, I would argue that, you know, my wife is tougher than I am at anything, you know, I got, you know, I think we, I get, think we would all agree with that. I get a bruise and I'm, I'm ready to take, you know, two weeks off and my wife can gut through just about anything. So savage. She's savage. Um, same, same thing here. I mean, I, you know, if, if squirrel white can you know, is tougher than you know, his 165 pound frame, you know, indicates then that that's only a feather in his cap. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, some of these freshman receivers are going to have some semblance of an impact. Is it a total of, you know, 
combined 10 catches all year, what, who knows? But I think whether it's Chaz Nimrod or Squirrel White or Caleb Webb, somebody in there is going to make a big play at some point this year. And I think a lot of that will depend on also, Eric, you know, what's the deal with Brew McCoy? If he gets eligible and Josh Heifel indicated on Monday that or Sunday that, you know, it was, you know, continuing to trend in the right direction, if he gets eligible, that changes a lot. If he's not eligible, then all of a sudden, you know, those guys are going to play a bigger role. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, those two names have created a lot of buzz so far early in camp. Obviously, Brew McCoy, he's the new factor, uh, the former five star, what he could do in this offense. But again, as you point out, he's you know got another hurdle to cross that's not been crossed just yet uh, to become fully eligible. But you know, scroll wide. Um, one thing's for certain, he is uh, he's not slow. That's what Josh Heupel said on Monday. Let's go ahead and hear from Josh Heupel comments regarding Squirrel White and Brew McCoy and kind of what they've done here in day one and, and really over the summer trying to get ready here for this fall camp. He's not slow, that's for sure. Uh, squirrel, squirrel's uh, competitive, really smart, um, mature in, in the way that he handles himself in the building, in the meeting room, uh, physically taking care of his body, uh, his ability uh, for the game not to be moving too fast, really almost from day one in, in the way that he's you know handled what we do offensively. Um, you know, he needs to have a, a great camp for us and, and believe that, that he will. Uh, he's truly fearless. Um, you know, he's not the biggest guy, um, but he is uh, fearless. He's going to stick his face in, in any physical situation that he needs to. Brew, you know, big, strong, long out on the, the perimeter. He's learned how to play in, in our offensive system and, and how to play from the whistle of the previous snap to the snap of the next one. Um, you know, for him, uh, I think he's gained a, bu a much better understanding of that throughout the course of the summer. You know, the first couple of weeks of June, so dramatically different than by the time we got to July with him. Um, you know, he's a guy that's played college football, right, and uh, competed at a high level. Uh, that maturity is something that uh, is uh, an advantage for him uh, in coming here and transitioning uh, to, to our football program. And then you heard it right there from Josh Heupel, you know, a lot of good things to say about both those guys. And, and I'm with you guys in terms of I don't know if Squirrel White will – you know, play a ton of snaps this year. But the beautiful thing about football is it's you can have different formations and different packages and different personnel. And so it will be hard for me to think that Squirrel White, if healthy, won't find the field in one of those personnels. But Brent, regardless, Brew McCoy, eligibility is still out there. But, you know, what he could mean to this offense, you couple him, a running mate with Cedric Tillman, and then Jalen Hot there in the slot, you got the poise of three guys that can be pretty dangerous with Hinton Hooker at the, uh, at the helm. Well, and three big guys. I mean, that that's the thing. I, I, you know, the thing about Brew McCoy, I know a lot of people are talking about, you know, what kind of shape is he in and this, that, and the other. I think the one thing you got to remember about Brew McCoy is Brew McCoy's been hurt. You know, he, he was he was banged up, you know, at, at Southern Cal. And, and he had, was – Had that hip procedure. Yeah, done. had a hip procedure done back. And so there's been a recovery period there where he's not been in the same training cycle yeah. as, as some of these other guys have been. And so I think that's why he's not, you know, in game shape at this point. I don't think anybody expected him to be. Uh, I think he's going to be fine there, assuming he gets the eligibility factor. But the one thing about those three receivers that you mentioned, if that's the three that they are, uh, boy, they're, they they got a lot of height. I mean, there's a lot and, and a lot of size. I mean, that they are not – Jalen Hyatt's not thick. I get that. He's not the heaviest guy in the world, but he's got height. The other two are pretty big boys. I mean, they, they can body some people up. Um, and again, you know, if you can get in a situation where you don't have to play one of those freshmen all the time and you can kind of spoon feed that in, boy, the, it changes because you can play a heavier rotation with guys, but, but maybe they don't have to know the ins and outs of everything to play. Clearly the slot position in this offense is more difficult to learn than the outside spot. So an outside guy is going to have a better chance of getting on the field quicker than an inside guy. If an inside guy picks it up, um, you know that that's a guy that's got a lot of football savvy to him if he plays it early. So we'll see how much Squirrel White can pick up if he's inside, or if they just bring him out there outside and say, "Hey, catch me if you can." They couldn't catch him on Monday. <laughs> no, no, he, uh, you know, <laughs> and they he, couldn't get their hands on him very well on Monday. As we yeah, know, uh, so should we call him Leonardo DiCaprio? <laughs> then? I'll go with that movie reference. <laughs> so you don't even know what Catch Me If You Can is. I know that movie. It's a caper movie. Go ahead, Rob Lewis. I was just going to say that was, in addition to just his flat out speed, that's what impressed me about him as a young dude was that, and he and I, he was going up against Vats. I mean, it wasn't like freshman or freshman. He wasn't getting jammed with a lot of scrimmage. He was able to get and. 
God, Hubber, how much how much have you talked about Tennessee's receivers beating press coverage <laughs> over the years? I mean, again, well, this is one day, it, one day. But I, mean, I has not so done quick. it yet. I mean, it, it's it's been the the mainstay of the matchup against Florida for the last two decades. It feels like. The, 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 am I wrong? Maybe it's the, I don't know. Just the size is probably not fair. The, does Squirrel White remind you of Isaiah McKenzie that played at Georgia? Is, is that it? Or do you think he's fast? He's maybe faster than McKenzie. I mean, or, or, I, I or think no. he's taller. I, I, let's look this up because I. Well, y'all keep talking about this because I. I want to say McKenzie's not nearly as tall as Squirrel White. Okay. Um, well, Squirrel for, White's not. He's not the tallest. I mean. Well, I, I mean, Isaiah no, McKenzie but, was not very big. I mean, either way, he wasn't tall and he wasn't. He obviously wasn't heavy. I just. I don't know. I, I just when you think about guys that are hard to get your hands on, Rob. That for whatever reason his. His name seems to pop up that, and you know, in recent years of guys that were that were kind of that way. I don't know that he was greatly utilized at Georgia during his career there, but but he was a guy who caused some people some problems. Isaiah McKenzie is five eight. Squirrel's five ten. There you go. So two inches there tall. Go. Um, <laughs> weight wise, pretty similar. I mean, it, it, we're going off of. 173, which is his current weight in the NFL versus, you know, squirrel being at 165 and, you know, fresh out of high school. So. Coming here at about 155 as well. So Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, Any way you want to spend it, I think those two guys are going to be creating all the headlines. I mean, Cedric Tillman's coming back, and, and you know what you have in him. Jalen Hyatt, he needs to step up, obviously. nothing. We're not breaking any news here, but you know who Jalen Hyatt is. I think you're going to hear McCoy and Squirrel, those two names, all throughout camp. But – when you flip the attention over to the defensive backfield in the secondary, these guys are going up against him one on ones and seven on sevens and all that. Um, obviously, a major question mark. Rob, you were over there. You got a pretty good look at the uh, at the defensive back room for day one. Again, it's day one. We kind of saw where some of these guys were practicing. Christian Charles is a corner, as Tim Banks mentioned. You had uh, Andre Turrentine at, at safety. You had Wesley Walker at star. I mean, you had you know Kamal Haddon and Brandon Turnage at corner. Uh, early impressions of that room, and and ultimately at the end of the day, and, and Josh Heupel said it today as well. You need competition, competition, but you do have you have tons of options, and that's something Tennessee just flat out didn't have last year. Yeah, that's the that that to me is what jumped out. I mean, I'm not saying they have any all SEC guys back there, but and, and again, it, it let's, as, as the caveat with everything, it's early. But uh, Hubbard, don't you agree that in, in the second, not just in the secondary, but all over the field, but I, I think especially in the secondary, maybe the past few years. They, some guys got to play a lot that maybe, you know, just had it handed to them, more or less. And whereas this year, I mean, because somebody had to play. And I'm not saying guys didn't work or whatever. Think about Alante Taylor and Bryce Thompson and Trey Flowers yeah. as their true freshman yeah. season because yeah, somebody had to play. Somebody had to play. And I think this year, for the first time in a while, in the secondary, you're going to have a situation where there, there's some there's going to be one, two, maybe even three good players who who, who aren't starters and who have, who have trouble getting time. And I don't think that's been the case in a while. Well, I think it's good. You know, we talked about it on the two minute drill on Monday. I think that you, you've got a puzzle that you've got to figure out, but you've got more pieces to that puzzle than you had. Um, and, and that, you know, in spring, you had no idea what it was going to be. And so it was a, to me, it was dramatically different day one, just because so many of those guys were out in spring, but they were back out there. I, I, I knew turn time AP. I mean, I, I kind of knew what to expect there. I, I'll be honest with you, Wesley Walker was not a guy that I, I I knew of him, but I didn't know a whole lot about him. Good looking. I mean, good looking player, good looking athlete. I mean, he he's, he's probably not gotten a ton of buzz when he transferred here. And since then, I, I think he's going to be really interesting to watch over the course of the next couple of weeks as Willie Martinez tries to figure out who fits where and how, because I, I think Walker could fit in a couple of different places potentially for you. They they do have competition back there for the first time because you guys, Rob, Eric, you guys were right. I mean, AP, three of those guys as freshmen were handed jobs the minute they gave out pads because they didn't have anybody else. Yeah, I mean, for me, like with Walker, he was a guy that didn't, you know, the last staff or two staffs ago, whatever, whatever it was, um, did not want – uh, did not go after, and he went to a really bad Georgia Tech program and just kind of went to work and has been a solid player down there for them, decided to use his remaining eligibility by coming back uh, in-state and playing here, and, you know, uh, kudos to him. I mean, it just shows that, you know, when you give a kid some time and, and, and you know, 
And then sometimes it's better off the kids to actually do go away and they could potentially always come back. Um, you know, when you look at, you know, just kind of where he was coming out of high school and what he's kind of made himself into. But, you know, there's a reason he didn't have a whole lot of buzz. I mean, but I don't know, Georgia Tech, there's not a lot of buzz around that football program, yeah. good, bad, or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's an interesting part uh, to the secondary hubs. I totally agree with you. And you're right, he does look the part. And, again, I think both him from an experience standpoint and then Turrentine just from a learning to work and the expectations that are in, at Ohio State – um, both of those guys to me come in here with a real feather in their cap. That kind of leads me into what Josh Heupel was saying on Monday about those two guys. Uh, the experience factor for Wesley Walker, again, not a lot of buzz, but he's played a whole lot of football, played a ton of football at Georgia Tech. Experience, good with the verbiage, equating what he did there over to what Tennessee's doing now. And then, Brent, I even, I even saw you, I think you put this on the board earlier this week, just – Something about being in a program, a winning culture, a winning program like at Ohio State's got, got your mindset a little bit different. Uh, here's Josh Heupel on those two defensive backs and kind of what they're bringing to the room here early on in camp. Yeah, I think both are very coachable. Uh, they have a high care factor. Uh, they have good uh, football IQ and understanding. Uh, Wesley, the amount of time that he's been in college football, he's able to to take a scheme that he's ran before and, and transition it into the verbiage that we have. Um, and uh, in that way, I think uh, not seamless, but it's been a, a fluid transition for him. He made a big play out there today. Want to see those guys compete in every area. Um, that's you know special teams. It's on the defense side of the football. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to earn reps on the defense side of the football. You heard me. You heard Coach Banks yesterday talk about us having to play more guys to have competition. We need more guys to to show that they're going to play at a championship level. Um, but those two guys, um, you know, bring some of the the football movement that we wanted, and they have a high care factor. So the secondary is going to take a little while to get figured out, of course. You know, finding the exact rotation at wide receiver, that's going to take a little while. Of course, the Brew McCoy hurdle that needs to be clear, we know about all that. The running back room, gentlemen, um, it is extra, extra thin right now. Austin breaking the story about Lenith Whitehead earlier this week. And, and again, he was not going to be a starter. He was not going to be the second guy in the game. But I believe he could have earned some reps, especially in short-yarded situations and pass passing situations to – sit back there and, and protect a little bit. But at the end of the day, now you have four scholarship running backs at current standing, two of which are true freshmen. And AP, that that room, it just needs some bodies in the worst way. It does. Um, you know, you, right now, I mean, Jalen Wright is, you know, basically watching from the side. They the couldn't even do some of the drills because they only had, like, three guys and then some walk-ons uh monday's practice i yeah. mean it, it looked thin yeah well i mean again jalen wright's battling the quad and and should be back in the next you know week to 10 days or so and then you know lynn j dixon is going to be a part of this football program he should be here i think wednesday i think he gets back in town later today and then probably will start his uh uh, acclimation period on Wednesday with the Wednesday practice. And then, you know, we'll see you go from there again. They still have to dot I's cross T's get him admitted to school, all those type things. Um, and so, you know, Tennessee didn't, you know, they just started working that on that this weekend when they, they knew that he's coming in and then they wanted to, you know, kind of get a feel for him and talk to him and stuff. Remember he came on a visit last year for a football game, but that was just on his own dime. Just wanted to come back here and see once he went in the portal you know, if Tennessee's a school he wanted to look at. Tennessee didn't really go on him. But now he's still out there having left West Virginia after three minutes and, you know, is someone that Tennessee, you know, out of necessity is is kind of forced to go and, and try to, you know, see if they can get something out of it. I think he's got the highest ceiling out of anybody that was on – that was left out there. Now, why do you leave West Virginia – you know, why did he leave Clemson? Is it as simple as, you know, he just, you know, didn't wasn't getting the um, the playing time at Clemson and just didn't like West Virginia? Is it as simple as that? If it's as simple as that, then I think you're going to be okay. But, you know, I think the floor for, for Lin J is, is uncertain, you know, um, whereas, like, I think his ceiling is, is fairly high because I think he still has uh, that get up and go in him. And I think he does kind of fit what this team does. He's not the bigger back, though, that Tennessee was kind of yearning for, especially with them losing Laneith. But, you know, again, best available. I think it's an interesting dynamic um, because I'm with you, Austin. I think he's got upside if he can find it. You know, obviously it went south for him at Clemson for whatever reason. But, Rob, it's, it's, a, it's a unique situation where you bring a guy in to an established room 
as things get started? I mean, right at the start of camp, how does how does he fit? You know, from a from a the, the culture standpoint, the personality standpoint, in a room that that had a pretty good pecking order kind of established with themselves throughout the course of spring practice and, and summer. I mean, the the newcomer was was Dylan Sampson, but there was a pretty good pecking order in place before you bring in somebody who's got power five playing experience. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I don't really have anything to add other than just to agree with you because it is a weird kind of a dynamic. You've got a guy who's, you know, going to be the oldest dude in the room who's, you know, played at a national championship program with, and he's going into a room where there's two two guys that have carried carried the ball in a college football game. I mean, he immediately, I mean, and I, I, I don't want this to sound wrong because I don't know I don't know a thing about the kid, but you know he his attitude I think immediately becomes a big part of you know that dynamic. What how, what is he coming in? Is he going to be content to be Jabari Small's backup and and kind of a you know a mentor to all these young kids, or you know or is he you know coming in thinking that he's he should be the starter? I I imagine that the way Josh Heupel runs things with the transparency that he runs his program that. They probably know the answers to those questions, but it is it is kind of a weird scene to man, to have it happen this to be bringing in somebody this late who could immediately be a big part of your offense, and you know, in, in a couple of weeks' time, is, is sort of a weird deal. Yeah, I mean, Tennessee's been wanting to add to that room, you know, really this entire cycle, and and obviously it's a, it's a necessity now. I mean, you got to go do it. I mean, any way you look at it. I mean, Jabari Small, and I say this with all due respect, I mean, he might get the first carry of the game, and I, I like him as a back, and I think he runs hard, and I think Tennessee's better with him, obviously, than without him. But, I mean, durability, I mean, it's 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 a great concern with him in terms of playing from one game to another, you know, one quarter to another. So, you've got to have somebody – in the way college football is now any days, you play multiple running backs, but you got to have somebody ready to go. And, you know, right now those two other guys are – you know, one's a sophomore that has had a really good offseason. I'm excited to see what he looks like in Jalen Wright. But, you know, these two freshman running backs, and Josh Heupel was really high on them Monday. Of course, it's just day one. I mean, Dylan Sampson, his mind's got to be racing, you know, 100 miles an hour right now. But I just think that elevates the need, Austin, for, for Justin Williams-Thomas to come in, let the game slow down a little bit. And, I mean, he weighs, you know, he's weighing about 205, 210 pounds right now. He could be the, I mean, obviously the the bigger back of the of the bunch back there that they can really count on this year. 213. Yeah. 213 is Justin Williams-Thomas. And 196 or 7 is Dylan Sampson, who has put on a chunk of weight since he got here. So, um, you know, trying to get him bigger. But, I mean, think about this. I mean, you talk about Jabari. Let's say he has another one of those deals with his um, upper body. And then Jalen Wright tweaks an ankle. All of a sudden, you're down to two scholarship guys. This is the same group last year, Hubs, that literally handed the football to Marcus Pierce in a real, real live in the game with Ole Miss. Scored a touchdown. Carry. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, it, that's where they were. I mean, that's where they were. And, and you know, Laneith has not been able to stay healthy. So, I mean, I listen, they need to bring in a back. There's no doubt. They need help there. So, I totally understand – why they're trying to bring in Lynn J. Dixon and why we expect him to bring in Lynn J. Dixon. He's the most talented guy available in a room that needs guys. They don't have enough guys right now. Um, you know, so th they absolutely need to do that. I, I think they've got guys who can carry the ball and, and can be effective there. I think they got guys who can catch it out of the backfield. My biggest concern with those guys is – can they pass protect at all? And, and I, listen, I know you're RPO in it. You got a quarterback who can run around, but but 42 sacks last year, good number of those certainly on the offensive line. Some of those on the tight ends. Some of that was in running back pass protection too. And uh, when your quarterback Rob doesn't drop five steps after he catches a snap, a lot of times those running backs got to be really physical. Can a Dylan Sampson do that? He's probably never been asked to do that before. Um, who can do that in this group? Uh, because that's going to dictate a lot of playing time because you don't want to get into a situation where, you know, you, you got your, your designated pass protector guy, but that group in general has to be better at protecting the passer. And, and that's something that a uh, Lynn J Dixon's going to have to come in and show that he can do as well. I think they can run it. I just don't know if they're going to be physical enough to pass protect. Yeah. And don't you guys agree? I mean, I think we, we talk about this in some form or another, every fall camp about some fresh running back, but really, you know, aside from, I, I, I'm in the camp that I, I don't think you can really coach a guy to be able to run the ball. 
that much. I mean, it's, I, I think that's the mo- maybe the most instic- instinctive thing in, in the game. I don't know, Eric. You, you played in college. What do you? I mean, you can you can definitely you know in techniques, fundamentals, where you hold the ball. But as far as you can't coach vision, I don't think you can coach feel. So much of it is instinct, but you can coach pass protection. I, and I think very few freshman backs arrive here appreciating just how big of a deal that is, and they're not going to play if they can't do it. Yeah, I mean, we saw we saw Justin Williams Thomas struggle with that, and, and again, he was a senior in high school coming to college early and, you know, seeing SEC level competition. So it, it's okay, but he struggled with that a lot in spring pass protection. Um, the linebackers are having a heyday with him. Jabari small has struggled with that in the past. Jalen Wright has struggled with that in the past. Lenith Whitehead, who was the best one, the most physical running back you had, of course is going to be out now. So, and Brent, this something, this goes back to something that we, we talked about earlier in the week and I tried to press Josh Heupel about it a little bit, but it's day one. So I understand it, but, uh, I think you're going to see tight ends in the backfield for that reason right there. Would you like having Princeton fan running routes? Absolutely. But would you like Princeton fan on third and five back there to protect your quarterback? Yeah. Um, And I think that presses a need even more. If you like all these slot receivers, maybe you go four sets and have Jimmy Callaway and hide out there at the same time. Maybe you see squirrel. Um, I just think that there's going to be a need to have some guys back there to protect Hendon hooker as season goes on. Well, there's two things there. Two, two points I want to make one everybody's sitting here listening to this going, wait a minute, you're talking about you can't play a running back if he can't pass protect, but then you're going to also rip David Cutcliffe for playing Mark Levine over Jamal Lewis because he knew the pass protections. There's not a Jamal Lewis in Tennessee's running back room right now. Okay. Uh, go, that's not, that's not a knock on those guys that this, that's a different conversation. Even in, even in Jamal's current form, there's <laughs> right. not a Jamal Lewis. In, <laughs> right. So, right so, so that's different. The game's also played a little different. Here's my concern to your point, Eric, about putting a tight end back there. I, I, I get the point. I think there's, I think there's validity to the point. How much are they going to need to tie in to help at left tackle? With pass protection. Yep. Are they going to have to? Are yep. they going to have to leave a tight end to help your left tackle spot against a quality pass rusher, as opposed to spreading it out and moving that tight end to the backfield and, and him being a blitz pickup guy? Do you have to have a tight end to help against the edge guy on the left side? Maybe you don't, but that question's not been answered. That's listen. That's why Josh Heupel and Alex Golish get paid a lot of money. And, and they, they, they smoke and mirrored some things last year to help mask some issues that they had. They're going to have to do that as well this year with personnel and scheme as, as well. So we'll see. Could you see a guy in the backfield? Certainly you could. I think how much of that may depend on how much you need that guy on the line of scrimmage to help with somebody on the left side. Yeah, and that makes that offensive tackle battle that much more fiercer, um, if that's a word, fiercer. <laughs> more, more fierce, fierce. with uh, – of course, J.J. Crawford and, and Gerald Mincy, who were flip-flopping and rotating. Again, no pads, but um, they're on day one. Uh, in that regard, it's week one. I mean, they're not going to get the pads on for a couple more days. Obviously, there's an acclimation period. But anything that we need to see, you know, what, as you go through and you you check off these boxes, um, you know, w- what are you guys looking for as the week goes on? They're going to practice every single day. Uh, they'll have Friday off. They're going to practice Saturday and Sunday. What do you guys need to see as the week goes on here in the first little bit uh, of fall camp? Rob, we can start with you. Uh, I mean, I'm probably most interested in just seeing how the, the secondary kind of sorts out. Um, you know, we talked, we, we we hit on that earlier, and I'm just interested to see, you know, who ends up where. To the, are, the, you know, the, are the guys that are safeties today? Are, are the guys at corners today? Are they in the same spot, you know, a week, 10 days from now? And, and who kind of starts to emerge there? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's – and you won't get this answer until they get in pads, so this is probably not the answer. You're looking forward to the question over the next few days. But for me, it's about the left tackle position, and then it's who do you find in the defensive interior? I mean, it, look, Elijah Simmons got to go now. Bryson Eason got to go now. I mean, like, like th- those guys need to go. I mean, Tennessee needs bodies in there, and, and they, they, they can't take – three, four weeks here to kind of get revved up and develop a sense of urgency. They, they've got to hit it running to, to go with Omari Thomas and, 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 you know, Deshaun Terry or DJ Terry. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that, that's the other one for me, but you won't know that answer until pads come on, but somebody else has got to emerge in that defensive interior. Um, and, and I don't know who that's going to be right now. Um, maybe that's Jordan Phillips, you know, um, I don't know. I don't know who that's going to be, but somebody's got to step up there for me, Austin. That's those are the two spots that that I'm 
needing some answers for here over the next couple of weeks? Well, there's just so – there's, you know, you got a lot out of Big O last year, more, I think, than, you know, than some thought they would. Um, you know, I thought, you know, DJ Terry's hit and miss. Um, Elijah Simmons and, and Bryson Easton are the two. I agree with you. I think it's, you know – whether you know if Rodney's cattle prodding him or whatever, like he's got to get those guys to take a huge step because they just need more than anything. They need depth, you know. Even if it's even if they're not talking about starting, if we're just talking about just sheer depth, like Tennessee needs that in the worst way at that position. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. You know, I know, you know, there's some hope for Bryce and Eason just because he has so many tools. Um, he just has to play with more confidence, you know, you know, some kids, you know, struggle with that. And I think if he can figure out how to play with more confidence, he can really take a huge step. And, and then Elijah Simmons, everybody keeps waiting on, like they had him put on weight. They've had him take off weight. You know, it's, it goes back and forth. You know, what do you want him to be? I think that that's where they struggle with. A couple of recruiting things. Let's head on real quick before we end the podcast today. Uh, the, the cookouts, the end of July cookout, right before the dead period began, once again happened just a couple of days ago. Talked to several, several 2024 prospects. Already run a, a couple of those stories. AP, uh, any big takeaways from this past weekend on campus with uh, about 25 uh, kids uh, over on Rocky Top? Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, it's you know, it's good to get you know some of those 24s back over here, like Cam Pringle. Um, you know, you know, MJ Bennett, uh, obviously getting Caleb Beasley back is big. You know, um, Tennessee would love to have gotten Boo Carter back or Marcus Gorey. Um, those kids ended up going to Ole Miss. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, kind of, you know, if they can get those kids back up here in the month of September and, you know, and, and see if they get here for a game. I think it's important to get them here for, you know, Florida or one of those, you know, really good atmosphere games if you can. And then, you know, I think the biggest thing is the 23s, you know, Stanton, Ramil, you know, everything points towards Michigan State. Uh, Ricky Gibson, I think that's still very, you know, up in the air at this point. Based off people I've talked to, he did not tell Georgia that he was coming. Um, but I still think Georgia is a major, major, major player there. Um, and then same thing with Jordan Matthews. That's Texas and Tennessee. And, you know, you know, Texas has kind of long been thought to be the team to beat. And, you know, we'll see if Tennessee can, you know, upset the apple cart a little bit. And Stan Rommel and Ricky Gibson are both set to make decisions here pretty soon. I mean, Rommel's been set to make a decision. Well, all, all three are going to come yeah. off the board. All three are going to be off the board in two weeks. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Rommel, I think, will come off the board sometime the next day or two. Um, as for, you know, Ricky Gibson, he said the fifth of August, which is later this week. I think it could push into next week. We'll see. And then I think like around the 15th or 16th for, for Jordan Matthews. Plenty of stuff going on at VolQuest.com. Week one of camp is in progress. Tons of two minute drills, tons of uh, media availabilities with assistant coaches. Josh Heupel's already spoken twice. Um, all that is up on the website, VolQuest.com. And of course, on the general's quarters, and you'll see it first if it's on YouTube. So go ahead and subscribe to us on YouTube. That way you get notified every single time we post anything. And this is the busiest time not, of the not year. Just so. li- not just subscribe. Like it, too. If you, if you like the videos, keep liking them. Yeah, th- throw a little heart up there, a little thumbs up. Like them, subscribe, do all that for us. And a big thanks, as always, to Smoky Mountain Organics. Three locations right here in East Tennessee. One right here in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike. Across the street from the Trader Joe's. And you can always shop online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. For Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs, and Austin Price, I'm Eric Kane. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today here on the VolQuest Podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest Podcast every week here on VolQuest.